Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. This video is one of a series about glaucoma. In this video, we're going to talk about treatment of glaucoma. Remember, this is for your information and does not substitute for evaluation by your own ophthalmologist. In simplest terms, glaucoma means damage to the optic nerve caused by elevated pressure within the eye. In the first video, we described how glaucoma is diagnosed. This one is about treatment. The strategy in treating glaucoma is to lower eye pressure to a level that the optic nerve can tolerate. A very important point is that this is different for each person. The majority of time, pressure control is accomplished by using eye drops, but there are other options that we will talk about. When glaucoma is found, how do we decide how much to lower pressure? To pick an initial target pressure, we need to know two things. One, the pressure at which damage occurred. This establishes the baseline that we have to get under. But we must also take into account how much damage has already been done to the nerve, as measured by nerve appearance and visual field. Once there has been the first increment of damage to the optic nerve, the next increment of damage appears to be easier, and the increment after that even easier. As a first step, we are usually aiming for a 25 to 33 percent reduction from the baseline. Here is a key part of the treatment strategy. The way you know the pressure is low enough is follow-up testing. Four to six months after starting drops to lower pressure, we repeat optic nerve and visual field tests. If they show no change, then damage should be stabilized. If there is worsening in optic nerve or visual field tests, then you must get the pressure lower. Keep in mind, glaucoma damage cannot be reversed. The best you can hope for is to keep it from progressing. The most common way to lower pressure is with eye drops. Drops lower pressure by either decreasing production of fluid going into the eye or making it easier for fluid to get out of the eye. Drops that decrease inflow fall into three separate groups. Timolol and beta-GAN, for example, are beta-blockers. Alpha-GAN is an alpha-2 agonist. Azopt and Trusopt are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Drops that increase outflow, Zalatan, Travitan, and Lumigan are prostaglandins. Alpha-GAN also has part of its action here. And there are combinations available for the convenience of only having to keep track of one bottle instead of two. The usual first choice of drop is one of the prostaglandins, the bottles with the blue-green tops on the left. They give the greatest pressure lowering with the least side effects. If pressure does not get low enough with the first drop, a second one is added from another group, one of the three on the right. That way you have one drop working on decreasing inflow and the second drop working on increasing outflow, so you are working on both sides of the system. Let us take a minute and discuss common side effects. The package insert contains an exhaustive list, but here we will mention just the common effects. Prostaglandins mainly have localized side effects, like darkening of the iris and skin of the eyelids. They can make eyelashes grow longer, which you may or may not consider a problem. Beta blockers can affect breathing, heart rate, libido, and worsen depression. Alpha-GAN is the one most likely to cause ocular allergy. It can also cause dry mouth and fatigue. Azopt and Trusopt usually sting when you put the drop in and may affect taste. So far, the drop form has avoided the serious side effects of the oral form. If drops are not successful at getting pressure low enough, then there are two other options, laser treatment and surgery. Strictly speaking, the laser is a surgery as well, but it is not as invasive and doesn't carry nearly the same risks. Laser treatment involves focusing the laser directly into the filtering system. Since you are treating the trabecular meshwork, the laser procedure is called trabeculoplasty. Application of the right amount of laser energy to the meshwork acts to improve fluid outflow. There are two kinds of laser trabeculoplasty, one with an argon laser called ALT and one with a YAG laser called SLT. SLT is advertised as kinder and gentler, 
but all studies to date show pressure lowering results and complication rates are the same. Here is how laser treatment is done. The diagram shows a mirrored contact lens in place on the eye, so we can look directly at the meshwork in the angle. Aiming is done with a helium neon laser that makes a small red spot. When that is on target, we trigger the laser, and for ALT, it fires a brief one-tenth of a second burst from the argon laser. This is a view looking into the angle much as we would see it through the contact lens. The meshwork is the tan band. The laser energy is absorbed by the meshwork creating a small burn, leaving a small white spot. Shown here are several laser spots and the red spot of the aiming beam ready for the next shot. The number of spots placed depends on your surgeon's choice. ALT or SLT makes a significant pressure reduction in about 75% of treated eyes. The duration of pressure lowering is variable, but it is a useful tool in the right situation. When visual field is getting worse and pressure cannot be controlled by drops or laser, then there are surgeries that can effectively reduce pressure. In the diagram on the left side, we are showing the meshwork as the ultimate obstacle to drainage. To get pressure lower, sometimes the only answer is to bypass the blockage by making a new passageway. That surgery is called a trabeculectomy. Shown on the right side of the diagram is a new passageway created at surgery that allows fluid to flow around the meshwork and out of the eye. Fluid does not go to the surface like tears, but collects under the outer covering layer of the eye called conjunctiva. This creates a little bubble called a bleb. From there, the fluid is absorbed into the tissues. While this can reliably lower pressure, it is generally held as a last resort because of the following issues. One is the basic risk of any invasive surgery. Two is recovery time. Vision may often be blurred for weeks afterwards. Three is long-term risk. An aggressive infection on the surface of the eye can penetrate through intact conjunctiva and gain access to the inside of the eye. For anyone who has had this kind of surgery, they should check in with their ophthalmologist if the eye is red or there is pain or decrease in vision. There are other glau glaucoma surgeries involving placement of a tube shunt or other devices, but we don't have time to cover all of those here. If you put forth the effort to use the drops and lower pressure, does that actually prevent glaucoma damage? In 1994, a large nationwide study was organized to answer that question. Before we start, let us define terms. We use the name ocular hypertension when the eye pressure is above the normal range but has not yet caused any damage. Once damage has occurred, then we use the term glaucoma. The name of this study was the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study, or OATS for short. Criteria for enrollment was the diagnosis of ocular hypertension, that is a pressure of 24 or above in at least one eye, and no evidence of glaucoma damage at baseline. 1,600 people were enrolled and followed for a minimum of five years. They were divided into two groups. Half were assigned to receive pressure-lowering drops, half were observed without treatment. This graph shows the percent of people developing glaucoma damage over time. Those who used drops to lower pressure, the blue line, had a much lower rate of developing glaucoma damage than those who were not treated, the orange line. This study gave us another important lesson. In the first video, we talked about corneal thickness having an effect on the pressure reading. This is the study where that effect was documented. On this chart, corneal thickness is along the bottom divided into three columns, thin, medium, and thick. Ocular pressure is on the left side divided into three rows, average pressures of about 22, 25, and 28. The height of the bar represents the percent chance of developing glaucoma over a five-year time period. In the left column, with the thin corneas, the glaucoma risk is clearly the highest for each row of pressure. So if you are found to have high pressure and want to know what is your risk of developing glaucoma in five years, this chart gives you that answer.
providing that you have a normal nerve and field to begin with. The key to successful glaucoma treatment is consistency, getting in drops and coming in for regular follow-up, which, for example, may be every three to four months for a pressure check and once a year for a visual field, depending on how stable your glaucoma is. Your doctor will help you decide that.